Hey, GP learners. In this session, I'm joined by the team from Medi2Data as we're going to go through their products, EMR and EMR Plus, which are basically designed to try and make medical reports a lot easier. That's insurance reports, other kind of reports, and especially those SARS, you know, those ones that cause you real challenges when you're working in practice. And we're going to go through their products, how that can help you save you time and make it so much easier. So let's get cracking and tech enhance your primary care and learning. Hey, GP learners. So I'm joined right here with Nick and Richard from Amedi2 Data, and they're going to be talking to us about their EMR platform. But how about letting them introduce themselves first of all? So if I can go first to you, Richard. Yes. Hi. Good afternoon to everyone. My name is Richard Freeman. I'm founder and chief executive of Amedi2 Data. Good Hi, afternoon, Nick. everyone. My name is Nick Freeman, and I'm, and I'm head of product for Amedi2 Data. Awesome. So through this session, we're going to go through what effectively EMR is and EMR Plus as well, the difference between the two. And I know you've got a lovely little announcement that's very relevant to a lot of my followers, which is the System 1 team, effectively, and how this works for them. But we'll come to that a little bit just in a second. But if I can pass it over to you, Richard, tell us about EMR. Thank you. Um, and good afternoon again. So EMR has uh, is a free software to allow page, um, surgeries to uh, create a uh, digital subject to access request um, records and also medical reports. Uh, we've been uh, producing and building and enhancing this technology together with clinicians and practice managers for the last three years. Uh, I have to say it's been very frustrating that it is only now that I have a, an announcement to make, which is that I'm very pleased to say that through the, the NHS Digital IM1 program, uh, we have been accredited through the witness testing and we are really looking forward to being able to activate TP uh, practices, TPP practices um, in the next week. Um, and uh, I would, if I may, like to share my screen, which I know is really good news, um, just for, for to show uh, in the preliminary, if during or after this video, you would like to uh, register your interest with respect to activating EMR, uh, then you can do so very simply by uh, going to our website, and I'm just going to bring that up now for you, Dr. Gandhi. There we go. Okay, that's great. And on the website, you come to the home page. Uh, all you need to do is, and we'll come on to EMR Plus later, but just click on EMR. EMR will take you to a page where you can set up. And as I say, if you decide to um, register your interest, you just pick Pick, uh, click on the TPP and you'll be able to complete a form. Our customer support team will be happy next week and the following weeks to get in contact, arrange in convenient time and assist you um, with uh, any issues or just assist you with the, the, the process. Um, the activation process should not take you more than about five, six minutes. It's a very, uh, it duplicates um, the, the, the practice and process that you're used to when engaging with uh, third party uh, partner products. Uh, through TPP. Um, the only element which is certainly not required when you first activate EMR is that uh, you can add users with their own specific um, permissions and you can do that certainly after the initial activation. As far as EMR's functions, uh, features and benefits, uh, I just want to highlight those before Nick takes you through a, a high-level demo of EMR uh, looking how quickly one can uh, redact and produce an insurance report, and also uh, critically, how much time can be saved in, in uh, processing subject to access requests and involving your patient in the process, which I think is really important for us to emphasize. Um, the standard features, uh, just to re-emphasize, we don't uh, offer packages. We offer one service, it encompasses everything, um, and it's completely free to the surgeries. Uh, also, our training and support is completely free. Now, some of you may be sitting there going, well, how does that work? Uh, presumably, Medi2 Data needs to pay for the technology, staff, and so forth. So we do need a revenue stream. And uh, we obtain our revenues from those uh, parties that request the information. So uh, it will be insurance companies, it will be the DWP, it will be outsourcers representing government agencies like the MOD, they will pay us a small administration fee that does not in any way influence your GP fees um, and it doesn't come off your GP fees and we come on to that. So the standard features which are free uh, are the auto redaction features, secure portal access, 
You can prepare your records before you push them onto patient online access. Uh, you can also uh, op operate a shared services model uh, through multi-site GP sites where the pipeline can be shared with other surgeries and other administration staff members. Uh, you can also have remote working for your GPs or other staff members being able to be off-site and still gain access. It's not just a clinical system, it's also an entire administration system around medical reports. So we will, on your behalf, generate your fee notes because we know what work you've done and, and the fees. And we will then process all of that and send them to the requesting party. We will obtain um, your payment and we will electronically pay your payment. So we will facilitate all of the administration around the payments. Uh, as I mentioned, the setup is very quick um, as the basic setup will be under five minutes. And for the practice managers uh, and staff members, there's a dashboard in which you are able to navigate and also have sight of your uh, work in progress. What we have been able to achieve to date for um, the EMIS practices that have been using, we've nearly got about a thousand practices that are using EMR. Uh, we have got case studies, which you will find on our website, and we'll be happy by all means, if you send us an email, we'll be happy to send you more details. But we've been able to deliver the following benefits. So there's been about an 82% in saving uh, in time and direct cost savings, particularly around the SAR which has been taken, you know, has taken surgeries up to a couple of hours to produce. Um, we're now uh, allowing that SAR to be produced in about 15 minutes, and there's no need at all to use any postage or burning to a CD and sending on. Uh, that can all be done through uh, authorizing third parties to view the SAR, and most of that work can be done by authorizing the patient. So we've stripped out a lot of the costs. There is specifically about 66% um, saving in time, uh, dependent upon your surgery, but approximately 10,000 pounds per annum can be saved uh, using EMR. Uh, we obviously have been working very hard with surgeries to ensure that we have government, good governance and GDPR compliance. And that was definitely spent during the years of 2018 into 2019, when we concentrated on the major problem for surgeries which was the fact that surgeries were no longer going to be paid for producing a copy of SAR records. And so we, our technology concentrated very much so on that particular feature, which Nick will be able to show you. Uh, GPs can sign off reports that have been pre-prepared by the surgery, and they can do that remotely. As I mentioned, it operates within a shared service model, which is great for our EMR Plus service, which we'll come on to. And it absolutely will assist you in uh, adhering or, 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 or participating in the NHS directives around patient online access and digitization. And again, uh, EMR is completely free. I'm going to stop sharing now and uh, ask Nick to take you through a demo of EMR and its features, and then we'll come back and, and either answer any questions at that time or we'll move on to our EMR Plus service. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Richard. So uh, what I'm taking you through now is a quick whistle stop tour of EMR. I'll be demonstrating how to process an insurance request, which has come through the portal and is already on the surgery's pipeline, as well as, as Richard discussed or mentioned, the ability to initiate a subject to access request and how to complete one of those within the EMR portal and sharing that with the patient. So here I've logged into the EMR pipeline and I've scrolled right down to the bottom here where within the pipeline, you can see that I've received a new insurance request. It says under a status of new, you will also be received, uh, be notified via an email letting you know that a new request has been sent. And once you're ready to complete that request, you would then click into the new, new button there. It then takes you through to this screen here where a confidentiality policy notification pops up. That just relates to the surgery's confidentiality policies. And we can see the scope of the request. So you can see the patient details, you can see the scope, so all the the conditions for which the insurance company is looking for. You can see the references. The insurance company has indicated whether or not the patient has requested to view the medical report or not, or whether the patient has requested to view the medical report or not, as well as the consent being attached there. There is also an additional questions section there, which uh, if the insurance company has any additional questions, they will list below. Once you're happy with the scope of the request, you would then click on confirm patient. At this point, EMR is going into your surgery's patient record system and identifying a matching patient. So you can see here we have the patient sought after and below the matching patient. 
So once you're confident and happy that this is indeed the patient you're looking for, you click select. At this point, we're taken through to this screen here. And this is a really important screen. As I'm sure you're all aware, some patient records can have a huge number of attachments. And in order for EMR to provide its auto-redaction functionality and time-saving mechanisms for those attachments, it can sometimes take a bit of a while. When I say a bit of a while, I mean anywhere up to 10 minutes for really large reports with lots of, lots of documents. So we've given you the option here to return to the pipeline and be notified once the redactions have taken place. And this allows you to go and complete other reports, to go and do completely different tasks altogether, just allowing you to go and have that flexibility. So for this demonstration, I am going to select return to the pipeline and be notified once the redactions have taken place. And you'll see I'll be taken back to the pipeline. And that case that I've just initiated under a status, status of new will now change to a status of redacting. So as you can see, that status of redacting is there. Once that redaction process has taken place, and as I said, that can take anywhere up to 10 minutes for really large reports, the status changes to in progress. So I've prepared a, a report previously. Once that redaction process is complete, you will again be notified via email that the report is now ready to view. You would then come into the pipeline and click on the in progress button. When clicking on in progress, you'll then be taken through to the provisional report contents of the screen. So the first thing that pops up is this sensitive information instructions notification. And this relates to the list of um, sensitive conditions supplied by NHS TRUD, which EMR uses in order to, to uh, supply its auto redaction functionality. So once you click on I understand, you can see the provisional report contents. So the first thing to note with all EMR reports is the format is always the same. So the patient profile will always be top left, significant conditions will always be top right, and so on. And that's to really build some familiarity with the system. But you can see here we have the patient profile on the left-hand side with all the relevant information populated in there. We have the significant conditions on the right. And if I could draw your attention towards the history of domestic abuse with a sensitive condition next to it. So this is a marking SNOMED code which has been picked up by the system as a sensitive condition and has been auto redacted. If for whatever reason I felt that actually it should be included in the report, I could simply click on it. The line would be removed. The green, uh, the gray tick would turn to a green one. And this would now be included in the final output report, which will come to shortly. That is the same for anything else. If for whatever reason you actually felt that diabetes was sensitive or wasn't relevant to the, re uh, to the request and shouldn't be included, you'd simply click on it and it would be redacted from the final report. Scrolling down under each section, you also have the ability to add some additional contextual information. So if there are any further comments that you think are relevant to the request, you have the ability to add those there. On the left hand side, we have medications, where again, you have the ability to redact each piece of information. Consultations, where you have the ability to redact a whole consultation by clicking on the date, or the ability to remove elements of a consultation by clicking on those individual elements. We have the allergies on the right and the blood results as well. Bringing us to the attachments. So within the attachments section, you can see that we have uh, several different attachments with the circles, with the orange circle, with the orange circles and a number in the middle. The number uh, will, and this is, I stress we're on a demo site at the moment, so it's, it, we are working in a demo environment, um, show the number of auto redactions that have taken place within the attachment. So if you wanted to view the attachment, you would click into that and then you could make any amendments to the attachment required. Scrolling down, we then have the ability to view any other coded items. So if there's anything that has been miscoded within the GP surgery, EMR ensures that it pulls everything that's been miscoded through, um, ensuring that we're not missing anything out. TPP practices. Uh, we have been engaged quite heavily on the basis of uh, understanding and, and um, ensuring that the coding system of, of, of SNOMED is mapped uh, as often as possible. There are going to be TPP identifiers, which unfortunately will not be mapped to a specific uh, SNOMED code. In those instances, it will be flagged on this screen as to those entries that have not been matched to a, uh, to a, a SNOMED code, allowing you the opportunity to include or exclude in the report. So that is something specific that we have programmed and engineered into uh, the production of the reports for TPP practices. Great, thank you, Richard. And as we go through the report, we also have referrals at the bottom. We have a suggested items to add section. So these are any potential consultations which need to be added and you can click into the sections and decide whether actually they are relevant to this specific condition or not. And once happy with the report, at the bottom, we would have the additional questions, which in this case, there aren't any. You then have the ability to preview and submit. 
So at this point, EMR is taking into consideration all of the amendments that you have made to the provisional report contents and finalizing that into a final output report. So as you can see here on the right hand side, we have the final medical report. So this is where all the information is. We've got the patient profile. You can see if I scroll through, bring us to the, the significant conditions where we've got the acute, the active in the past. And you can see that history of domestic abuse has been included in there now because I had unredacted that and so on. Once you're happy with the report, you'd scroll down to the bottom. You would then accept that a MediData exchange cannot be held responsible for the contents of the report, that you are indeed happy with what you are signing off. And once happy, you would click on submit. At this point, when you click on proceed, we're then taken back to the pipeline and that instruction has entered a status of finalizing. So at this point, what we're now doing is we're taking that report and making it available to the instructing agent while also processing all of the invoices and payments on your behalf so that you don't have to do anything at all. And that is the insurance report. What I'm now going to show you is how to initiate a subject to access request, which in many cases you would receive as a paper based copy or an email to the GP surgery asking you for a copy of the medical records. In order to do so, and this differs slightly to the insurance report where the instruction was directly in the pipeline, you would come up to the top of the screen and click on create new instruction. You would then have access to a host of different report types here, but I'm going to specifically select subject to access request and then click on confirm instruction type. You're then again taken through to the confidentiality policy notification and are requested to enter some patient details. So I'm going to be using our dummy patient today. We require the name, date of birth, and address. So that's done Nick, by... if I'm, Nick, if I may, while you're doing that, just to give you a chance. Um, so to be clear, um, there are two ways in which TPP practices can receive instructions and process, either directly from the requesting agent using the EMR portal, which will take the instruction and deliver it straight into your pipeline, and you will, uh, as a practice, get emails to whoever, whichever parties you would like to be uh, notified of the of the uh, instruction pending. And the second way is if you receive any paper instructions coming through uh, the post or via or emails, then you can, as is being um, illustrated here, you can go ahead and process that instruction through the system as well. So it should cater for all eventualities around those instructions. Thank you. Great. So once the patient details have been entered, you then have the ability to enter a date range. Some subject to access requests will request the full medical records. Other may provide a date range for which they would like the information for. And once you're happy with that, in this case, I'm going to do a full medical records. You click on submit. At this point, again, we're trying to find the matching patient. So you can see here we've gone into this surgery patient records, found a matching patient. I'm happy that this is indeed the correct patient and selected that option. Now, slightly different to the previous process, we then come through to this screen, and this is specific to subject access requests. As Richard touched upon at the very beginning, we want to create the ability for GP surgeries to share the, those patient records with the, G, with the patients in a, in a GDPR compliant and electronic way. So you have the ability here to select who you'd like to share the records with, either direct to the patient or return to a third party. In this case, I'm going to select direct to the patient. And in order to do so, we need the email address, which if in the patient records will be auto populated and the phone number. If you were to select the return to a third party, there would be some additional information we needed, and this would allow the third party to have access to the report. But for demonstration purposes, I'm just going to go directly to the patient. At this point, it's an optional uh, se section here in, as to whether you would like to upload the consent form that has been sent to the GP surgery attached to the request. This, is, this again, is an optional uh, step as you are the data processor and controller. However, uh, in this case, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to click on proceed. And again, we come through to the screen where you have the ability to continue working on the report or return to the pipeline and be notified once the actions have taken place. Again, I'm going to do that and we'll be taken back to the pipeline where the subject to access request will enter, enter a status of redacting. Much like the insurance report, once that redaction process has taken place, it will go to in progress. And once you're in, in progress, you'd go through the similar process to the insurance report where you would review the contents, make any amendments and sign that off and submit it.
I'm not going to go through that as we'd be re replicating ourselves there. But what I'd like to show you is the patient process and how they receive the medical report. Once that report is signed off, they receive a text message as you've provided the phone number, as well as an email. I'm just going to uh, share my screen on the email for a moment. And There we go. This is the email that the patient would receive. So you can see notification from your GP surgery. Hello, Sarah. As Sarah was our patient. Uh, your subject, your authorized subject to access request has been processed by, in my case, MediData Medical Center. You can securely access your medical record here. The patient would then click on that link there, which would then, and again, I'm going to change my screen over to the, the portal. which would then take the patient to this link here. At this point, the patient has entered our uh, EMR patient portal and has the ability to request the code. So what we're doing here is we are um, doing a two, two dual factor authentication process to ensure that the patient is who they say they are, which I've just received now. So I'm entering the code 250454. Uh, I can then access the report. The patient has some terms and conditions to sign off. And once they accept those, they come through to the patient portal where they have four options. They have the ability to view the report, the ability to download the report, print the report and authorize a third party. So what a lot of GP surgeries who are using EMR now are doing is instead of authorizing the report to go directly back to the third party or the solicitor who's requesting the medical information in the first place, they're sharing the subject to access request with the patient initially and the patient has a really secure and easy mechanism to share with a third party within the within the portal by author, authorizing a third party, entering the details and providing access to that third party for a time period of 30 days. And that is uh, just a whistle stop demonstration of EMR and its functionality. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, and, and that was really good quality in terms of the functionalities and stuff. Um, I guess I'm going to ask you a couple of quick questions on EMR now, if that's all right, just because I'm aware that these may come through from the chat. And then we'll go through to talk about how EMR Plus potentially may add to the kind of offering that you've got. I guess but the main question I just did want to ask, obviously, that deals with stuff that's in the electronic records. Obviously, patients have physical records as well. Hopefully in the next year or two, that will change with the digitization of records and make this whole process seamless and electronic. But for those patients where there is still a physical record, how will that work with your system for EMR and stuff? Nick? Y yes. So with the uh, physical records, often the Lloyd George records, uh, what, what we suggest to our GP surgeries currently utilizing EMR is that they have the ability to... Um, to upload this as attachments within the patient records. And we will actually provide the auto redaction functionality using OCR on those Lloyd George records uh, mm -hmm. so that they can be processed as part of the subject to access request or the wider, or the wider insurance report. However, at this moment in time, that would obviously require the individual to scan the Lloyd George records and include them as attachments within the patient record. Um, so it, it, it's a difficult process with the full pa with the paper records because obviously there is a digitization required there. True. I guess the flip side of that, though, is that if they were doing the SARS or, or that kind of stuff anyway, they'd be doing that work anyway, because that's kind exactly. of the only way to, to, to process it and stuff. And so um, I guess hopefully once that's done, it's done once for that patient. Um, obviously, as I said, the digitization of records is due to happen in the background. The practices I know some places are going through the pilots right now. Some places have already gone through it and some practices will obviously be heading towards that in the next year or so. That will deal with the whole bulk of the patient records. Um, but up until that point, yeah, obviously it's just something to be aware of. I think um, that there is that extra step that's possibly needed, but it's an extra step you're doing anyway. So, yeah. If I may add Dr. Gandhi to mm. that, just for one minute, um, we are actually um, an AWS partner. And as a result of that, not just from a storage perspective, but also from a software perspective, they've got some really good um, uh, optical character recognition software um, also uh, taking handwritten notes and um, converting it into type format. So effectively, uh, the ability to take unstructured data and structure it and then clinically code it back into the record. And that's the sort of work that we're ongoing with SNOMED themselves as our strategic partner. So there's some really good development work that will be ongoing once that scanning process has taken place and how that data can be more meaningful and structured 
for for the clinicians and practices to be able to use efficiently. Cool. And um, so we're going to talk about email plus in a second. Just before we go through that, we've had a couple of points come through on the chat. So um, SMRM Rose has said about what about back scan records. I'm assuming from the comment that's what we've already talked about but if it, it hasn't answered the question feel free to clarify that a bit further in the chat we'll come back to that a bit later however lisa has um, pointed out quite clearly um that you know working across various practices actually quite a lot of practices have already summarized the, the kind of the patient records and stuff that would definitely work i think for reports be aware that for sars that may not be enough data in terms of it just being summarized particularly if they're asking for the full medical record so there may still need to be that physical step for for the written records to be transferred. Obviously, if that's not there, well, there's not much you can do about it anyway, so it doesn't yeah. really matter. Um, so we're going to talk about EMR Plus, which is, I kind of guess, the, it's the newer service that you're offering, and particularly in response, I think, if I remember rightly, from the, some of the stuff that's happened with COVID. Talk us through that, Richard. Uh, be happy to. I think, uh, if I may, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and share uh, just another okay. slide. So um, th th this does require a little bit of background. So it, it was last April, um, and um, suffice to say that our world's changed um, dramatically. And um, as a business, we felt that it would be inappropriate to solicit um, GP practices for uh, activating EMR because they lit literally had no time and we didn't want to take up um, any time at all. However, what we did feel we could add value to the primary care and assist was EMR plus. Now this requires the activation of EMR, uh, but what uh, the service does is allow all instructions received by the surgery to be outsourced to us under a data sharing and service level agreement. Uh, it means that instead of the surgery having to take any, uh, any uh, preparation of the report or sign off the report is completely outsourced to Medi2 data, uh, the company, uh, EMR plus the service, and through remote access to our virtual surgery called MediData Medical Center, uh, we have remote clinicians, GPs, uh, who when we have prepared the report, uh, will sign off that report and we will return it to the requesting uh, agent party. Now, um, what it entails for the surgery is through our NHS email, um to receive for, for the surgeries to send out the um, scan and, and send out the uh, instruction letters to us on on preferably a weekly basis um it does include sars but i will say that the product mix is looked at um with respect to the surgery because obviously we would be happy to undertake your sars but we will also expect to receive um your insurance report requests um, and, and another request to the MOD, firearms, et cetera. So we can do all of those. Uh, we receive the instructions. Um, our administrators, through the remote access and have had permission, will then come into your, um, through EMR, into your clinical system. They will create a view, as you have seen Nick uh, demonstrate, the reports and SARS records. And we will then notify our, our panel of um, GPs and clinicians to come in. And what they're doing is they're going through and they're checking for third party references um, or any sensitive conditions. So it is a check on redactions. Um, and that is their, is their role. Uh, once they've uh, gone through that and processed the report, we will then return that report to the, uh, um, uh, to the instructing agent. And uh, we will pass back a small fee to the surgeries based on the fee paying reports, uh, the insurance reports. Uh, but we are literally taking over the whole process. If you would like to go to our website, um, I can take you actually there now. Um, if we go to this section, which is the resource and in case studies, uh, a significant case study was the Horton Thornley Medical Practice in Manchester, where uh, they were um, expending 12 hours a week of admin time and six hours a week of GP time and they were able to free up uh, pretty much the entire 18 hours a week, which is a really uh, significant uh, saving. So uh, we started with a few surgeries um, back in, in May, as I, as I mentioned, and we now have um, 
uh, many surgeries uh, and our number of reports have increased by 200% month on month. So it's been an incredible growth for us. Uh, I think surgeries are finding that once they get used to EMR and are comfortable with EMR, they're actually outsourcing the whole service um, so that it, they really can take advantage of the time savings. So that's uh, an explanation of our EMR plus service. So if people did want to start up with EMR Plus, um, aside from filling in, obviously, the the, the forms and, and stuff, is there any additional stuff that needs to happen from the practice perspective? You did obviously mention the data sharing agreements. I guess, is there any extra work they have to do around that part and stuff? It's a fairly standard um, data sharing agreement. Uh, so surgeries obviously have signed it off historically, so we don't expect any any issues around that. Uh, we we have a service level agreement that is a mutual service uh, level agreement on the basis of how often we receive the instructions and what our role is in making sure that we deliver on behalf of the surgery uh, and the patient. Um, and other than the activation of EMR, no, that's that's it. It's really quick. Cool. Um, so I'm going to open it up to questions that we've got from the chat and stuff in terms of the various different things that we talked about, both in terms of EMR and EMR Plus. Just whilst we wait for some of those questions, I'm going to give you guys a, a couple of the ones that I know that I've already had from earlier, just to kind of lead, lead us on and stuff. Um, and I guess the first one that I've got is um, in terms of it's one that always comes up. It's the question of cost. Um, how exactly are the costs done both for EMR and specifically more EMR plus? And, and yeah, just talk us through that if that's all right. <coughs> Gladly. So um, again, for a surgery to activate EMR, there are no costs attached whatsoever. Um, there are no costs attached to the training and support that they may require. And that isn't um, time um, restricted, that is, as, as a customer of, 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 uh, of Medi2 data. Um, we, as I mentioned earlier, apply an admin charge of £18.50. Um, so there, there we go, £18.50 plus VAT. And that fee is uh, sent um, in conjunction with the GP fee, which is handled by us as a disbursement cost. It's fully protected. And that is billed to the insurance company uh, or the requesting agent. And then we get back uh, the fees and then we pay out the disbursement co uh, cost directly to the surgery. Um, with respect to the EMR Plus, it's slightly different. So we're effectively on um, as the entity, the third party administrator, we're generating our own fee. And we agree with the surgeries for the insurance reports, a small fee in return uh, that they get. The main positive from the EMR Plus, and there's no cost to the EMR Plus service at all. Um, so it's a free service. We we will bill um, the re requesting parties when it's appropriate to do so. We pay a small fee out to the surgery for the insurance reports, um, and we handle all the billing and everything else um, on top. So uh, that, that's important. All the admin is completely... Cool. Uh I think we've just temporarily lost Richard. Oh, no, we've got him back there. There we are. Um, thank you for that, Richard. I guess if I'm going to ask you, push you for an example. So if we were using EMR uh, Plus and say, for example, it was a report that was uh, the practice would normally charge for, for roundness of numbers, let's say £100 for a, a medical report, for example. Can you give us an idea of kind of the, the what the practice would expect to see if they're using the EMR Plus service for, for that particular report? Uh, yes. Um, so, I mean, commercials usually are done in discussion direct with the surgery, but as a, as a, as a sort of a, a high level um, approach, we would pay the surgery £10 uh, from that um, as a, a fee. Uh, I must stress that if you work out uh, from that £100 actually what the surgery would be making if they were doing that task um, themselves, um, actually that £10 goes a long way to, to almost a clear uh, revenue without costs, uh, as opposed to incurring the costs against it. So, um, but that, that's what in the example you've given that hundred pounds would, would would generate a ten pound fee back to to the surgery. I, I think if I may, Dr. Gandhi, just another mm -hmm. really 
important factor with that is, you know, when we're talking about the EMR Plus service, the fully outsourced service, it's for all report types. So you send us your subject to access requests, your, your DWP, DVLA, MOD requests. We'll do all of them, and a lot of them don't have a fee associated with them. Yeah. So that it's the way the commercial agreement works is it's ten pound a report. Uh, per fee paying report so any fees any reports that would usually conduct a fee there is a 10 pound kickback to the surgery and all you have to do is hand us over the report and we will do it on your behalf mm -hmm. I, I i i therefore want to add again if i may it's really important that there's an element of trust here between us because it is a free a free service and we're doing but um obviously we will be monitoring the number of sars as an example versus some of the fee paying reports so that we have the right balance and we'll work with the surgery to ensure that 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 happens over time and i guess looking at that from a partner perspective obviously me as a gp partner and a time productivity perspective you know um i would say that right now obviously the clinical workload and demand is crazy you know we're in uh, so we're filming this on the date 19th of may you know um things are bonkers at times when it comes to clinical demand and, and things and i think you know having a service that can take away some of those additional pressures from the practice absolutely useful and effective and as a partner coming down to do reports and that kind of stuff it's one of the more frustrating parts of my workload because it can sometimes take quite a significant amount of time and you know at times we are having to pay for locums to cover the clinical workload because i'm busy doing other stuff and actually if i wasn't doing that stuff how much more efficiency would the practice have in terms of patient facing services um, and you know other potential costs that they could save on so you know um i know sometimes some people get, get bogged down on the cost and i know i've pushed you both for that deliberately so that we've got a bit more clarity but actually is that a bad thing absolutely not in my view you know it's about trying to have more efficiency within the practice as well that therefore allows you to do work more effectively and particularly <coughs> the, the work that we are paid to do, which is, you know, the, the patient facing stuff and that kind of thing. So I, I think, you know, that still represents good value in terms of how the practice will function in terms of the longer term and stuff. So, yeah, the, 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 if, the, the, the other element that, yeah, sorry, I, I didn't mean to talk over you, but the, the other element is we, we, we launched this as a flexible service. It's a switch on switch off. Mm -hmm. So I don't want anyone to out there to think that they are beholden upon uh, contract terms and, and so forth. It's a very flexible service. But what's really interesting is over the 12 month period, what was deemed uh, or, or um, regarded as a temporary service that surgeries would take advantage of and then bring back the work in house, a minute number of surgeries have brought it back into house. So um, if anyone wants to try it, see what impact it has, um, are still happier to bring it back in after that experience, there's total flexibility to do so. Uh, but the suggestion is that actually it may become a longer term relationship, um, which works for both parties really well. Cool. So I guess next question I had, um, from your perspective, obviously you guys have created this, you know, you run it and, and stuff. W what do you see is that unique thing that sets you out from, I guess, other people that are doing similar sort of stuff, you know, across the practices, you know, and an area and that kind of stuff, you know, what's the USP from your perspective? Yeah, I, I, I think, um, firstly, one is, is, is the clinical coding structure of, of how we go and extract um, data from the patient record. Um, and I think that association with the uh, SNOMED clinical codes not only provides a, a really accurate way in which reports can get completed for the surgeries, but equally it provides huge value to those that are requesting the information because it means that levels of automation can be brought in for an insurer. Because we're operating in clinical coded structure. Um, that means that automated decision making can be, um, be programmed in with reinsurers and insurers as an example. Now that isn't apparent, um, may not be apparent to GP practices. So we're delivering real value back to the patient's insurance company, um, allowing claims to be uh, paid faster, underwriting decisions to be made so policies can be issued. So that that that's our, I would say is a, it. I mean, you can't have more than one USP, but that 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 probably is it. Other other features that that we have that I think um, hopefully came through in the demonstration that Nick did is one: we automatically pull the attachments through from the document management systems. 
And I, I pluralize that deliberately. It's not unspecific to any one. Um, it will work with any document management system. So I think that's really important. I think secondly, bandwidth and system um, integrity and, and um, stability is really important. So large SARS records can be processed in the background. We've got huge servers that are operating in the AWS environment that are allowing that functionality and durability um, to, to, to be processed without disturbing other tasks that can be done. Um, we, we're not just a clinical tool. We also, you probably glean from my um, explanations and descriptions that we're an administrative tool too. So we take away some of the back office, um, well, quite a lot of the back office uh, pain with respect to issuing fee notes, chasing the money, uh, doing the reconciliations. All of that will be done through the EMR uh, technology for you. Um, and as I said, automated payments will be made into the bank accounts. Um, so those those are are a few. Um, Nick, have I have I missed anything out there? Yeah, I, I think maybe just a comment regarding the SNOMED codes. Not only does the SNOMED coding allow great benefit to the the requesting agent, the insurance companies, but it also allows us to automate much of the task on behalf of the GP surgery. So when the insurance companies are using SNOMED codes to make the requests, what we're able to do is only pull through the relevant information in the patient records through to the provisional copy of the report contents. And then the, the GPs or administrators within the surgery are only viewing the, the relevant medical information as opposed to identifying which information is relevant to the request. So that's how we're able to deliver that 66% time saving in completing a request because we automate much of the task on top of the um, the, the auto redactions and things like that. Cool. Um, so we've had another question come through, if that's all right. So this is from Mark B. I'm just going to read it out so I don't get it wrong. Um, so if we are currently using IGPR for some insurance reports, how will the insurance companies transition if we start with EMR? Will we still get requests through IGPR? So the answer to that <coughs> is no, you won't be getting the requests, although you can use EMR. So if you're getting requests through IGPR and you would like to use EMR, that is your choice as a practice. So you can certainly take the instruction and go ahead and uh, process it through EMR. Um, there are two other means of receiving um, uh, instructions, and one is through the EMR pipe. Uh, and we're signing insurance companies by the month now, actually, um, quite significant ones. Um, so those instructions will be flowing through. Or you can take the instructions via email or through the post and go ahead and, and use EMR to instruct those. Um, equally, you can uh, compare the two systems gladly and, and run some reports through both and, and make up your own minds. Um, obviously, you, you need to make the right decision. Fair enough. And I guess the other key benefit I see from this is the fact that it's completely remote. In, in terms of the way that it works, obviously that this doesn't take up issues with the states within your practice. It doesn't take up, you know, um, the workforce within your practice in terms of how it functions and things. And I guess to, so I know we've not had any further questions, but I guess to wrap us up on what my perspective of EMR. So a lot of our eagle-eyed EGP learners will probably remember that I actually did a demonstration with Richard about, I think it was just over a year ago or so, um, looking at the EMR platform itself. Um, I showed that demonstration to our practice team um, and simply said that they said to me when can I have it and slightly annoyingly we've had to wait a while because I we were on TPP and I know that as you said from your announcement earlier that you know hopefully that will be switched on in the next week or so for use so very keen that we can see how much this is going to help us in, in practice because I, I know that that particular workload is a real challenge for several practices my own included in terms of managing the the, the forms, the, the reports, the requests, and the definitely those SARS and stuff, and having a better way, a timely way, a more efficient way of doing that that doesn't take up significant practice resource. Yeah, anxiously waiting for that solution, and hopefully this is the one. So definitely would recommend people have um, a chat with Richard and his team. Um, I know that you guys are also joining us for the System One Facebook Users Group conference at the end of June. Um, so, you know, more than happy that people can have an opportunity to have a look at it again and a bit more interaction, hopefully, with, with your team as well to answer specific questions if they want to see what it's like. But if it wants at that point, you guys should be live. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, I can't see any further <laughs> questions. Um, thank you both of you for your time. Um, what I will say is if some, anybody does want to check out um, uh, Meditudata and EMR and EMR Plus, I'll put the links onto the descriptions down below so you'll be able to click straight through to them or obviously just 
Google it, you know, it will take you straight through to them and, and stuff. More happy to try and feed any further questions towards the team. Ultimately, obviously, check them out on their website and stuff. And yeah, if you do want to check out that earlier video I mentioned, if you have a look right here, it should be coming up right now in a second or so. Alternately, we're always here to try and show you other content and stuff. And at EGP Lane, we're here to help tech enhance your primary care and learning. And we will catch you in the next episode. See you later.